Good morning, guys. Welcome to day one of the fall intermittent fasting challenge. This is our 28 day fall intermittent fasting challenge, and we're kicking it off with detox week. I specifically designed this challenge to have detox week because I'm also personally on my own weight loss journey as well postpartum. And it's just such a great tool to help kickstart the journey, especially if you've, you know, had maybe like the past couple of weeks, you've had a vacation, or if it's the holidays, maybe you consume some foods that aren't as in line with your goals. This is such a great way to just kickstart your wellness and weight loss journey. Um, as well as postpartum for myself, I'm using it for my own goals too. So selfishly, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, but today we're going to be going over for week one of the fall intermittent fasting challenge, the best detox foods to help support your liver and weight loss goals. So as I mentioned, it is... I guess, as I mentioned, it is week one of the fall intermittent fasting challenge. We, we are starting off with detox week because it is such a great tool to help prepare the body for intermittent fasting. Uh, I'm sure plenty of the people in the chat who have used um, the program Sephora will let you know that using the seven day detox first, really helping to clean out the body, clean out the liver um, and provide additional resources to help support the liver as well. It's such a great tool to kickstart the process and just makes intermittent fasting so much easier. So if you guys want to join in, this is week one of the fall intermittent fasting challenge. We are starting off with the seven day detox or detox week. The details for how to join are linked down description below. It's not too late. So make sure to check out those details in the description below if you want to join in. OK, so why do we even detox like this gets a bad reputation because unfortunately there's just a lot of like like fluffy terms around detox that don't really actually mean anything um, where people say like, oh, this is this is. Um, like green juices, for example, like you are detoxing when you have green juices and you just hear that word like thrown around a lot. So it kind of loses its meaning. But in reality, we're always detoxing our liver and as well as additional organs, but mostly our liver is always processing toxins. And that's what the detox process is. However, um, there's just so many toxins in our environment now between what we're actually exposed to in the air, but also what we're eating every single day that can actually back up the liver, cause our liver to just not be able to process all the toxins that it's taking in and therefore storing those toxins as fat on the outside of the liver, which can ultimately down the road lead to some liver issues like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NASH, and eventually way down the line, possibly even cirrhosis. Um, so what we want to do when we're focusing on like detox week is helping the body to process some of those toxins that we might have been taking in that our liver didn't have time to get to previously. Um, in the seven day detox, I go a lot more in detail on the different phases of detox and how there's phase one, phase two, phase three, how each of these foods that we're going to talk about today really supports each of those um, phases to help you get the most out of supporting your liver while it's doing its thing. Like none of these foods are actually doing the detoxing for you. It's just providing the resources for your liver to be able to perform at its best. So if you want like more of those details, obviously the seven day detox program, um, which is included in the um, 28 day intermittent fasting challenge is linked down in the description below and you check that out. But ultimately we're looking to help support the liver before we jump into intermittent fasting. So we can already start off on the right foot with higher energy levels, um, improved insulin sensitivity, which when we have fatty liver, it actually makes our body more insulin resistant and of course mental clarity so let's oh and the foods that inhibit the detox this is kind of important too before we even dive into the foods that help to promote detox because we need to make sure that when we are going through the detox process we're eliminating the foods that or as much as we can eliminating the foods that um inhibit detox or or back up our liver that our foods that um, re are required to be broken down by the liver. We want to reduce those as much as possible so that our body can then address those stored toxins. Um, so the foods that inhibit detox or that are required to be broken down by the liver obviously include um, alcohol. That's probably the most common one um, that we know of. Like when people think of detox and um, the liver, we think of alcohol. But more commonly, actually, that we see in just day to day life is fructose. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, that is very, very common. It's, it's exploding now, unfortunately. And it's because of our huge intake of fructose, whether it be from fructose, um, high fructose foods like high fructose corn syrup or agave, which a lot of people think is like healthier and it's actually sneakily just pretty much 
as bad as high fructose corn syrup. Um, a lot of fruit juices obviously are very high and very dense in fructose, but anything that contains sugar is half fructose. Fructose needs to be broken down by the liver. Um, so ultimately that is something that we want to really greatly reduce when we're looking to help the liver to support itself. So the seven day detox program goes into a lot more detail on all the different foods that are going to inhibit detox. So if you, again, make sure if you're in detox week, check out the detox program and make sure that you're really addressing the removal of those foods because that's just as important as the addition of the detox promoting foods. So let's dive into some of the best detox promoting foods. So in the seven day detox program, I have a lot more foods listed in there, but I wanted to highlight some of the ones that I think are really easy to implement and also are really um, backed up by studies as well to help support the liver during the detox process. Broccoli is the first one. Now, if you guys haven't seen lately on my, um, I think it was in my most recent What I Ate in a Day, I was sharing how I've been having a lot of the detox salad or the um, broccoli detox salad. It's because it's so good, but that's that's an aside. <laughs> so the broccoli, having broccoli, it's really high in something called glucosinolates, and this helps to aid in phase two liver detox. So it also has um, sulfur, helps support glutathione production. Glutathione, um, there's a lot of big words that I'm throwing around right now, but glutathione is our internal antioxidant. So you know that you can eat antioxidants, but actually the most powerful one that we can have in our body that helps protect our liver while it's going through this detox process is glutathione. And we make that within our body. So sulfur, um, selenium, um, the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli are really great at helping to support glutathione production so we can help protect our liver during the detox process. So uh, glutathione helps to quench or like um, reduce the impact of the free radicals while we're detoxing. And like I mentioned, the, the detox broccoli salad, which is pictured right there, so good, such an easy way to sneak in so much broccoli. And it's so, oh my gosh, so delicious. It is in the seven day detox program. All the food is amazing, but that one in particular is like my latest favorite. Okay, the next food, cauliflower. Cauliflower is in the same family as broccoli, so it has a lot of the same benefits as broccoli. But what I love about cauliflower, in addition to everything else that I just mentioned with broccoli, is that you can use cauliflower as a rice replacement. So um, rice is very high glycemic load, which just means it has a very big impact on our blood sugar level. And um, when we have like rice or even brown rice, which also is still very high glycemic load, it's not really great for our blood sugar levels. It, it causes us to have these big spikes and falls. And when we have these falls in blood sugar, it makes us crave more sugar. And ultimately sugar is something that we need to be reducing or removing, especially added sugar during the detox process, because remember sugar is half fructose, which is broken down by the liver. So having these lower glycemic load foods during the detox process is really great for helping to stabilize blood sugar level and make sure we're not craving foods that will work against the detox goals. Plus more helpful from a weight loss perspective as well. Next up, we have eggs. So eggs are really rich in something called choline. And choline um, is pretty hard to get in our diet outside of eggs. There are some other foods that you can get it from. I think like white beans are, are one of them. Cauliflower has a very, very, very small amount of choline. <clears throat> um, but choline is actually really important for liver health liver health because low choline levels have actually been found to um, lead to liver cell death, which obviously when we're trying to support the liver, we don't want our liver cells to be dying off. We want to help support the health of the, the liver cells. It's also been found to be linked to impaired fat metabolism, which is fat breakdown. So we want to make sure we have enough choline in our diet. And it's really easy and simple to get choline in our diet when we have eggs. Just two to three eggs per day is enough for most people to cover all of our choline needs. So that's why in my seven day detox program, you'll see that I have the detox scramble in there, which also has some broccoli in there to help sneak in more of the um, detox promoting foods. Or you could just add on um, hard boiled eggs to your salad. If you want that option, you could make egg bites, which I've shared an egg bite recipe on my blog recently. So many ways to have eggs to sneak in your choline intake. Next up, we have turmeric. So this is one that you've probably heard the most about. Like when we think of detox, you probably think of turmeric. If you've like read a little bit about detox, it is like the most uh, common ingredient that is talked about. And it's because it does help to speed up phase two liver detox. So uh, that phase two liver detox 
um, is one of the three phases within liver detox. It helps us speed it up so we can get those toxins out of our body faster and safer. So you do need to make sure that when you're having turmeric, if you want to get the most bang for your buck, you're actually pairing it with ginger or black pepper, both of which actually help to um, increase the absorption of the, of the curcumin, which is the active compound in turmeric, into our body. So you're actually getting the benefits of turmeric. So you can add it to your smoothie. That's a very easy way to do it. I have like a pineapple ginger um, turmeric smoothie. That's amazing. A very great way to sneak in turmeric. Um, or you could add it into your chia pudding, into your yogurt. There's a lot of different ways to use turmeric. Um, I have the detox chia pudding recipe that's on my blog. If you guys want to check that out, you can just type onto Google like autumn baits detox chia pudding recipe. It'll pop right up or you can search it on my blog as well. So very easy way to sneak in turmeric. Brazil nuts are also fantastic because they are incredibly rich in selenium and selenium is required to help actually make glutathione which remember is our antioxidant that is super important for phase two liver detox so we want to make sure that we have enough of that um, glutathione to help quench those free radicals and with brazil nuts you actually get all of your daily selenium needs with just two to three Brazil nuts per day. You can have too much selenium. That is possible. So you want to make sure that you are not overdosing on Brazil nuts. Usually two to three is plenty for most people to get what they need for selenium. So you can add it to your smoothie or you can eat it on its own. I like to add it to a smoothie, just like add two Brazil nuts to my smoothie because I personally don't think they taste great. I think like when you bite into them, it tastes a little bit like dirt, <laughs> but when you have it in a smoothie, you don't even taste it. Um, so it's a great way to add it in and get those selenium perks. But if you aren't a fan of Brazil nuts, another great way to get selenium is with beef. Beef is also really rich in selenium, um, also high in protein. So we have obviously on my channel, we talk a lot about protein and the importance of protein from a weight loss perspective, from a body recomposition perspective, um, and to help prevent sugar cravings. So remember during the detox, we don't want to be eating sugar. We don't want to be craving sugar to make, because otherwise if we're craving sugar, it makes it really hard to maintain our progress with the detox of not eating sugar. So if we can not crave sugar, it makes the whole detox process so much easier. So if we eat enough high quality sources of protein like beef, it helps make it so we don't crave sugar because protein helps to increase our satiety hormone, peptide YY, which literally tells our brain we're full, we're satisfied, we don't need to eat. It also helps stabilize blood sugar levels so we don't get those crashes. So beef, in addition to having um, a rich source of selenium, which is important from the detox um, process, it also helps prevent sugar cravings, which makes the detox process so much easier. Um, so if you are going to have a burger, like if you're having beef or ground beef and you want to have a burger, you can do like what I have pictured here and just put it in like a lettuce wrap. Um, a great option to do is using the um, iceberg lettuce. It's really crunchy. Not a lot to it other than water, but that's okay because beef is so nutrient rich and all the other food you're going to be eating is so nutrient rich as well. But it is a nice crunchy way to like enjoy the lettuce bun so much more. I recently had that at a restaurant local to me where they used um, the iceberg lettuce. It was so good. <laughs> it like totally brings the lettuce like bun game up 10 notches. Okay. So next up we have ginger. So we already talked about how ginger is important to help boost um, the turmeric or curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, um, helps to increase that absorption. But what I also love about ginger is that from a non, actually this is also very important for detox, it helps you stimulate the MMC or the migrating motor complex. So this is a system that helps to flush out left behind food and bacteria from our GI tract. So from a gut health perspective, as well as from a deep deep bloating perspective. It's really important. Um, but also from a detox perspective, it helps to flush out what our liver has processed and puts into our digestive tract to eliminate. So if we have a stagnant GI tract, then it really isn't going to help eliminate those toxins that our liver just processed. It'll just get reabsorbed into our body, which of course is not good. We want to eliminate those toxins. The liver breaks it down. Our colon with bowel movements um, is one area that we help to eliminate those toxins that our liver is broken down. Obviously, sweat and urine are some of the other main ones. Um, but with our bowel movements, also very important. Also why it's important to have fiber during the detox process too. Um, but 
yeah, so you can easily fit in ginger with a smoothie. Like I mentioned, pairing it with the turmeric, um, like pairing a turmeric and ginger in the pineapple smoothie, amazing. Or you can make ginger lemon tea, especially at the end of the night after your last meal. So good. That's what my husband and I do pretty much every single night to help promote gut health, but also just because it tastes good. You literally just chop up some ginger, chop up some lemon, boil it with some water, and that's it. It's amazing. I also have the ginger cacao superfood smoothie in the seven day detox. That is amazing. Okay. Next up we have salmon. So everybody, I think most people know about how salmon is really rich in high quality anti-inflammatory omega-3 fats. Um, but specifically why it's so great for the liver is because of DHA, which is one of the omega-3 fats. So DHA has been found to help prevent liver disease, specifically NASH. So, um, in the seven day detox, you can find all the studies linked for each of these, um, things we're talking about. So DHA also is great for, for brain health, for memory. Um, so we want to make sure that we're also incorporating those high quality, healthy fats too. Plus high quality fats are just really great for helping to stabilize blood sugar level, helping to prevent sugar, uh, further sugar cravings. So you get both the perks of the DHA, high quality fats, the anti-inflammatory fats, um, as well as the protein that's obviously in salmon too. So it's a great protein source to be inc incorporating during the detox week. About four to six ounces cooked is going to be uh, roughly for most people, a good range to aim for. Some people might need a little bit more, like if you are really, really working on increasing muscle mass um, or, you know, variety of different reasons why you might need to increase your protein beyond that. But for most people around four to six ounces at one meal should cover most people's needs. Okay. And then bone broth. Bone broth is another great one that contributes something a little different called glycine. So glycine is an amino acid. It's used specifically again in that phase two liver detox. So you can use bone broth in a bunch of different ways. You can sip on bone broth um, or you can cook with bone broth. So in this picture here, you can see my broccoli soup. So it's the reviving detox soup. So you sneak in the bone broth as well as the broccoli too. So you get a couple of different detox promoting foods within um, just one meal. And then of course we have water. Now this is one, cheers if you have some water with you right now. <laughs> uh, this is one that is especially important when we are um, focusing specifically on detox because it's it's it helps us to actually eliminate what the liver has processed. So we already talked about how we have bowel movements and that's one way and which is why fiber is so important to actually bind onto those toxins and eliminate them, why the gut health portion is so important, but we're also going to be sweating and peeing. And those are other main ways that we're going to help to eliminate the toxins that the liver has processed. So adding in enough water, I put on here that I roughly aim for about half my body weight in um, ounces. So for example, if you weigh like, 150 pounds, then you'll want about 75 ounces per day. If you're exercising, you might need more. So about 16 to 20 ounces, or if you're sweating a lot, you might need to add an additional 16 to 20 ounces. Um, you can also try adding in apple cider vinegar or lemon to your water, like I pictured here, um, to help add the additional perks of blood sugar stabilizing benefits. Uh, there's quite a lot of research around apple cider vinegar and lemon juice, both having those benefits of blood sugar stabilizing perks. <laughs> uh, you also might need to add in electrolytes. So again, I go a lot more into this in more specifically the 21 day intermittent fasting program on the need um, for electrolytes. But when you are eating foods that are not as blood sugar spiking, um, when you're drinking more water, our electrolyte needs tend to go up. You can typically tell that you need electrolytes when you have headache, if you have muscle aches, if you're low in energy, sometimes even, uh, sometimes even constipation can be um, a side effect of an electrolyte imbalance. So make sure that you're also checking out if you need electrolytes too. I usually use Element or Celtic sea salt or Redmond salt to get in my electrolytes. Okay. So this is the, if you guys are just joining in, this is the fall intermittent fasting challenge. We are in week one. Everything that we just covered right now is to help support you during the seven day detox week, which is the initial week before we dive into intermittent fasting. So it's a 28 day challenge with the first seven days. We're focused on detoxing, helping the liver to process old toxins, make sure that it's so much easier to then transition into intermittent fasting. 
And then the final three weeks is when we're adding in the additional um, protein, fat, and fiber approach. We're adding in intermittent fasting for the metabolic flexibility. There's also the workouts as well, which is something that men and women all around the world have used to help them achieve their goals. So if you guys want to join in, it's not too late. Even if you're diving in today or maybe next week, you can feel free to join in whenever you want that fits your schedule. Um, you can just grab the details for how to join in with the link down description below. Otherwise, I'm going to get to some questions. If you guys have some questions, just put four question marks before or before and after um, your questions so it's easier for me to find them. Um, oops. Okay, Dawn, can any other specific recipes from your programs be used in the detox week? Almost all of my recipes are going to, at the very least, not have the ingredients that are going to inhibit detox. Uh, they just might not have the additional um, detox promoting ingredients. So most of the recipes from my complete intermittent fasting bundle can be used during detox week. You'll just want to also add in or maybe make some swaps for some of like the veggies um, or some of the spices to get in the additional detox promoting ingredients. So for example, if one recipe calls for bell pepper, um, as like the vegetable that's incorporated along with it, then you can add in some broccoli instead. And that way you're getting the additional detox promoting ingredients in there. Speaking of water, I'm gonna have some water. <laughs> okay, someone's asked, oops, <laughs> meant to click this one. Why does the chia breakfast bowl bloat me? I love this, but get so bloated. So it could be a couple of reasons. You could be sensitive to chia seeds. Some people are. You might want to test out basil seeds as an alternative. Um, basil seeds don't contain the lectins that chia seeds do. So if you are finding that you're sensitive to chia seeds, you can just completely swap them out for basil edible basil seeds. So I did a whole video on basil seeds versus chia seeds and why you might want to try out basil seeds instead. Um, you can find that on YouTube. I think if you just type like Autumn Bates basil seeds <laughs> on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Um, but that would be one way to help solve that problem. Or you could try blending the chia seeds. So just like in a coffee grinder first, and that could also help. Uh, Jen, is fasting okay during menopause? The thing that I found is very important because I have quite a few um, AM peeps from all around the world who have gone through menopause and have been able to use some form of intermittent fasting along with the meal guidelines that I recommend and help achieve their goals. Um, the thing that's important to remember is getting having your eating window be big enough so you actually are able to get all of your protein needs in. Protein needs actually increase as we age. They don't decrease. They increase because we have increased bone loss and increased muscle loss. So if you... Um, the common mistake I see with women in their 50s or 60s or 70s is that they'll hear about the benefits of intermittent fasting and want to do like a 20 hour fast or OMAD or alternate day fasting because if fasting is great, then a longer fast must be even better. Um, but you need to balance out those benefits of having the fast as well as having the eating window to fit in all of your nutrient needs. I'll be going a lot more in next week's live stream, more specifically into intermittent fasting strategies. So um, when we start the intermittent fasting week of week two, we'll dive more into that. Uh, wow, Stephen, good morning from the, from the Yukon and back on the treadmill. It's been almost two years following you and 100 pounds later, I took the summer off from IF, so I'm excited for this challenge. It's a total reset. Congratulations, Stephen. Oh my gosh. And cheers to being on the treadmill right now. It's great multitasking. <laughs> um, Merit, does any meat or fish provide selenium or is it specific to beef? Beef is specifically very high in selenium. So specifically beef is going to be one of the better options. But if you don't love beef, you could always um, incorporate the Brazil nuts as a good way to get in selenium too. Does gum break a fast? Now, technically you're not consuming it. So obviously if it has sugar in it, then yes, um, definitely will. But even if it's a zero sugar option, um, you're technically not consuming it. So technically it wouldn't have 
maybe that insulin response. My iffy area on why I don't recommend having gum during the fast is because when you're chewing, it's stimulating the digestive tract. It's telling your body that you're about to have food coming down the pipe and getting ready to digest. For some people, that could cause an insulin spike because it's called the um, cephalic phase insulin response. So it's your brain. Cephalic means your brain or your head your brain thinking that food is coming. So it starts to produce insulin to get ready for that food to absorb it. So that's why I don't recommend gum because it still could break it fast in that sense. Oops. Um, so if you guys are just tuning in, we are in the fall intermittent fasting challenge. It is day one today. We're starting off with detox week, just help prepare the body for intermittent fasting, help make that transition so much easier. So if you guys wanna join in, link is down description below. And if you have questions, put four question marks before and after your question. So it's easier for me to find it. Tatum, when do you know to detox? So like I mentioned, detox, your body's always detoxing. Your liver is always going to be processing toxins. What I like to, the way I view the seven day detox program is a really great reset. It helps to, because uh, we have to consider what the, what it is that your liver is doing. It's processing toxins. It's processing the foods that our body can't just use unless the liver breaks it down. So it's going to be alcohol, sugar, refined carbohydrates, a lot of other toxins that um, the liver needs to break down. So if you've had points or periods of like, let's say increased consumption of alcohol or increased consumption of sugar or processed foods, or maybe this is your first time and you've always eaten like that, um, your liver could need that additional help of just having that clean slate. So it doesn't, you know, it's a good idea to, especially if you've, we're coming into the holidays, if you've had um, more alcohol, if you've had more sugar, if you've had more sweets, if you've had more um, potato chips or refined carbohydrates or breads, etc. things that the uh, liver needs to break down, it's a good idea to just give it a little bit of a break. Uh, is it okay to eat grapes as a meal? I would not recommend eating grapes as a meal for a variety of reasons. First of all, no protein. Um, second of all, grapes are very high in sugar. It also tends to be pretty high glycemic. Um, so you get that big blood sugar spike in fall. Uh, I have a video, I forget the title of it right now, but where there's CGM or continuous blood glucose um, or glucose monitoring data that found for a lot of people, um, grapes had a really big impact or really big spike on their blood sugar level. It's not that you can't ever have it, but it is something that you definitely need to make sure you're not just having as a meal. Uh, Merit, is it okay to use low fat cottage cheese and Greek yogurt rather than full fat? Will we get the same amount of protein? The protein shouldn't be affected when you have the low fat options. My the reason why I always recommend the full fat options is because you actually get the full benefits of the full fat dairy products when you have the full fat. So when you have low fat, you have significantly lower vitamin K2 and vitamin K2 is pretty hard to get in the diet outside of fermented dairy products. You can get a little bit as well from pasture raised um, eggs. You can also get it from something um uh, a fermented soybean product called, I always forget if it's natto or nato, N-A-T-T-O. Uh, but the, one of the richest sources is going to be fermented dairy products. And we need vitamin K2 to help get calcium out of the arteries and into the bones. So it's really heart health and bone health protective. Um, so you don't get it when you, or you get significantly less when you have the low fat dairy options. So that's why I always recommend full fat. Plus studies are actually showing that full fat dairy products are better at helping with achieving a weight loss goal than low fat, likely because you get the benefit of both combining protein and fat so that you get the increased satiety hormones and it helps prevent cravings. So for a variety of reasons, I don't recommend using the low fat options, um, but if you were to use it, you will still get the same amount of protein likely. That's usually not altered. Uh, Elizabeth, can you take turmeric in a pill form? Yes. So I have seen that there are, um, I think ancient nutrition has like a fermented turmeric supplement. So there are people who will take that. I believe it also has ginger or black pepper in there to increase, um, to increase absorption. I personally just like to add it to my food. It's easy. It's less expensive and it usually tastes pretty great. But yeah, I have seen that you can use turmeric from a supplement form. Like I mentioned, I think ancient nutrition is the one that has the fermented turmeric pill supplement. <laughs> pill just sounds so like weird. 
Mm. Oh, thank you, Nora. Hello from North Carolina. I'm glad I found your channel. You have the most doable and simple recipes. I'm following your recipes for two, three days only, and I already feel better. That's amazing. Thanks, thanks for sharing your experience, Nora. I, I mean, all of my recipes I specifically designed to be really simple and taste delicious because if you don't love what you're eating, you're not going to stick with it. So I'm very, very passionate about seeing the community love the recipes and, and um, that they are very simple and that their family loves them, that their husband, their kids all love them. Because again, if you aren't going to love your food, then you're not going to eat it. Uh, <laughs> wow. Carol, hang on, let me uh, click. There it goes. <laughs> I just tried your pumpkin cream cold brew with a scoop of whey protein to break my fast. Oh, wow, yum. Yeah, I shared on my blog, I think it was last week, my like copycat zero sugar version of um, Starbucks uh, pumpkin cream cold brew, I think is what they call it. But yeah, if you guys want to check that out again, lots of information on my blog as well at autumnlnutrition.com. So you can go to autumn, E-L-L-E nutrition.com and then just head over to the blog and that's where you'll find recipes like the pumpkin cream cold brew. Um, Trinity, I'm 21 years old and someone warned me intermittent fasting might not be good for my age because of hormones. Is that a real concern? Yeah. So it's not necessarily intermittent fasting. It's it's how intermittent fasting is done. And this is where I'm really passionate about making sure people balance out the fast with the food. Because unfortunately, so many people hear the benefits of intermittent fasting and they're like, oh, well, if a 12 or 13 or 14 hour fast is great, then 20 hours or 36 hours must be even better. And although there could be a time and a place from a disease prevention perspective, or maybe if you're working specifically with a doctor on a specific protocol, some of these extended fasts could be useful for the general population. I found having a wider eating window, like having a 14, maybe a 16 hour fast um, so that you have a 10 or an eight hour eating window is so much better for actually getting in all of your nutrient needs. So especially if you are in a state of growth, um, if you are an athlete, it's so important to make sure you allow for that slightly wider eating window. Or if you are going through menopause, um, if you're 50 or older, then you tend to have those higher protein needs where that uh, eating window of eight to 10 hours is going to be better. Some people might even need a little bit longer of an eating window, um, but it is so important to make sure you're balancing out the benefits of the fast with the benefits of high quality food. So also knowing how to properly break a fast, making sure you're eating enough of the protein, fat and fiber to support your goals. Um, because ultimately, if you're just intermittent fasting and just eating less, it's all of the negative effects of also just typical calorie restriction, which has negative effects in terms of semi starvation for women's hormones as well. So it's not necessarily that intermittent fasting is not a good idea, but it's the way that people take it and um, and take it to the extreme and just eliminate many meals. <laughs> that That is not the way that you want to go about it. And unfortunately, that's just how a lot of people will talk about it on the internet. So you want to make sure that you're also balancing out your fast with your feast and getting enough food to support your goals as well. Which is why, again, I created all of these challenges too with the complete intermittent fasting bundle with teaching you how to actually structure your meals to get enough food to help adjust it depending on what your goals are, um, to have amazing recipes to go along with that that are very simple. So if you guys want to join in on the challenge with all those details, link is in the description down below. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it okay for sandwiches with eggs and cheese and pepper and ham? I eat it every morning. Sandwich is the the word that I um, take issue with. <laughs> and it's because sandwiches obviously mean bread and bread is a refined processed product. So it can tend to cause a big blood sugar spike in most people. It's not going to be the most ideal option um, to have with your first meal. But everything else you listed, the eggs, cheese, pepper, ham, those are all low glycemic load, high in protein. So if you wanted to still have a sandwich type experience, then using something like a coconut wrap, a egg wrap, which you can find at most grocery stores now, where it's just made out of eggs and you can just use it as a wrap and wrap these ingredients into more of like a breakfast burrito situation. That would be um, a better option for blood sugar stabilizing benefits and getting high quality protein at the same time. 
Um, okay, I'm gonna answer a few more questions here. I see a lot of questions, so I'm gonna try and get to as many as I can. Okay, uh, what do you suggest the best supplements for a fatty liver? I personally like to always address food first and making sure that the what you're actually taking in, which is what can lead to a lot of the fatty uh, liver issues, especially when we look at population studies, it's oftentimes coming um, from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which often comes from a higher fructose intake. doesn't matter how many supplements you're taking if you're not addressing the food first, because we're taking that in every single day. So the liver can only process so many toxins. Um, and once it's hit its max, that's when it's going to start storing those toxins as fat to help prevent the toxins from reaching the brain or the heart, et cetera. Um, so I personally don't really like to talk about supplements until food is addressed first. Uh, Bonnie, hello from Kansas. Can we eat too much protein? It is very hard to do so. You are much more likely to overconsume on carbohydrates, on sugar, so much more likely to overconsume on that because there's no real satiety cue from those foods and you are of protein. Most people are so vastly under consuming on protein that it's not really a concern on overconsumption. The studies that have been done on trying to test out what that overconsumption line would be for people is well above three grams per kilogram of body weight. I personally recommend a range of um, 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. Most people aren't even hitting about half of that. So just to give you an idea, it's very, very, very hard <laughs> to over consume on um, protein, especially if you are getting it from high quality sources. So research is definitely showing that it's, it's very difficult and, and almost, I won't say impossible because you never know, but almost impossible when they um, have these overfeeding studies where they try and get people to overfeed on protein. And they found that, especially when, again, from the animal based high quality sources, um, the satiety cue that you get from protein from the increased peptide YY hormone tells our brain we're so full, we're so satisfied that we just don't want to eat more. Uh, hi from Iowa. Hello. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Just found your channel about a month or two ago, binging your videos, learning so much. This is my first challenge. You're amazing. So grateful for you and your knowledge. Well, cheers to your first challenge and cheers to everybody who, if this is your first challenge, welcome. Um, we have so many amazing AM peeps who, which is the community, Autumn L Nutrition peeps, um, AM peeps that are in the community, in the Facebook group too. If you guys haven't joined the Facebook group and you're part of the challenge, highly recommend it because there's, I think we have like over 18,000. I think we're approaching 19,000 members within the Facebook group right now. And everybody is so supportive. It's such a a great place, a great source of accountability, but also for sharing your journey and just maintaining the excitement for your journey, which is so important for helping to maintain your progress. Because when you're excited, you want to keep going. And, and when you keep going, you feel even better. And it's just this continuous positive cycle. So if you haven't checked that out, um, Mary Kay, definitely check it out and welcome. Uh, Diane. Do any other veggies promote detox like carrots, peppers, etc.? Um, you know, you the veggies that contain fiber are also very great, um, but typically the ones that are going to be best for helping to promote detox are the cruciferous veggies. So the broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, kale, those are all really great for helping to promote detox. Um, onions and garlic, we didn't get to in today's live stream, but when you find it in the seven day detox, they both have the sulfur containing ingredients that also helps promote detox. So I just um, talked about 10 of the uh, high quality detox promoting foods today, but there are others. Um, those are just some of the high, the, the ones that you will most easily and readily find. <laughs> Whitley, any tips on how to fit in exercise with a baby? I'm laughing because I personally um, just had a baby. She just turned two months old yesterday. And now I'm finding I'm getting in my workout at about 5 a.m., which means I'm personally getting up at like 4.45. So that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> that's what I'm doing right now. And so it means I'm definitely going to bed very early so that I can balance out getting high quality sleep while also fitting in exercise um, and working and taking care of a baby. So I would just try and figure out what... Um, 
time of day you will be able to consistently fit into your schedule for exercise because exercise is so important especially resistance training to be able to get the blood sugar stabilizing perks longevity perks um, a lot of information and research coming out now on the importance of having muscle mass and strength for longevity so it is really important to fit in but i trust me i know it's very tough um, but it does require just taking a look at your schedule and when you will be able to consistently get that exercise in. And it doesn't have to be a long workout. Like my workouts are usually about 20 to 30 minutes long. Um, and so if you can just maximize that time, really increase the pr productivity when, when baby is like down for a nap, that's that's what I found to be helpful. So just make sure that you're not sacrificing your sleep for the exercise. You want to make sure you're still going to bed earlier if you are waking up earlier. Very, very important. And congratulations on the baby. <laughs> yes, Diane, turmeric is great in eggs. I agree. Yeah, I have the detox, um, turmeric detox scramble on my blog as well that uses um, turmeric in eggs. Laura, can we replace the coconut milk with unsweetened almond milk in the detox recipes? Yes. So I didn't get to almonds actually, but almonds, not necessarily in almond milk because there's not a huge concentration of almonds in almond milk, but almonds do um, also contain glycine, that amino acid that bone broth has as well. Um, so yeah, you can definitely use unsweetened almond milk. You can use any unsweetened nut or seed milk. So like there's hemp seed milk, um, flaxseed milk, almond milk, cashew milk. Um, I think there's even like macadamia milk, macadamia milk. The one that you just don't want to have is going to be oat milk. Oat milk is very, very high in starches um, that can raise the blood sugar level and cause that big crash. Um, let's scroll down a little bit so I can get to some of these more recent ones. Okay, Arcelli. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, can I have AG1 on my detox eating window? It's funny that you mentioned that. I actually just ordered um, AG1 because I want to have like a 30-day test of it and um, to report back to you guys on my experience with it. Oh my gosh, it is expensive. <laughs> but I wanted to test out and see if it's really worth the investment. Um, so I'll be doing a full video update on that probably in like a month and a half after I've done like the full 30 days um, of AG1. But to answer your question, can you have it during your eating window? Yes, you can have it during your eating window. You just can't have it during the fast. It will break a fast. So stay tuned for that video. It's coming soonish, like in a month and a half because <laughs> I just ordered it, just got here. Uh... Jennifer, can we overconsume fat? The times I've found that it's easy to overconsume fat is when protein isn't consumed enough. So when you are under consuming on protein, um, it's it's easy to eat more of the fat portion than our body actually needs because we aren't getting satiated from protein. I just did a video on this uh, like two or three weeks ago. Um, I forget what it is. If I can come across it, then I'll put it in the description down below. But if you just watch like my last couple of weeks worth of videos, you'll find it. <laughs> um, but this is why it's very easy to overeat on nuts, for example, if you aren't eating protein along with it. So if you're just having like a handful of nuts, which are really high in um, fat, but very low in quality protein. In fact, nuts have zero quality protein. That's one big myth, a nutrition myth within um, the the space <laughs> that nuts are high in protein. They do contain protein, but it's so low quality that our body doesn't use it in the same way as other proteins. We don't get the benefits of that protein that we do from other high quality sources. So it's just pretty much eating fat. And so if you're just eating that, you're not getting the additional satiety perks that are even stronger from protein. So it's very easy to overconsume on the fat portion. Um, just like how it's very easy to overconsume on carbohydrates in general when you don't have protein. That's why it is so important to get enough protein for your body's needs. I have a video um, that helps you to calculate your needs if you want to like get really more specific in the nitty gritty on how much protein you might need to support your goals. So if you just go on YouTube and type in Autumn Bates how to calculate your protein, that video will pop right up and it's a great resource to make sure you're getting enough protein to get satiated so that you don't overconsume on fat or carbohydrates. Uh, 
PB, daily cup of unsweetened kefir okay during detox? Yeah. In fact, I have a um, smoothie recipe that uses kefir within like the base of it to get some high quality vitamin K2 as well as some protein. It's just not very high in protein compared to like, let's say Greek yogurt. So you'll just want to make sure that you're not counting on that as your protein for a full meal. Katie, I can't believe Sage is already two months. I know, it's so crazy. <laughs> Sage, for you guys just tuning in, is my daughter. Um, just had her, and I'm on my own postpartum weight loss journey as well, but she's already two months, and time is flying by. <laughs> uh, Brev, you may have addressed this, but it is it important to follow the recipes for each meal, um, or can we switch out breakfast or lunch or vice versa? Yes, you can feel free to swap the ing or swap the recipes around, um, even if you just want to completely not have one meal on one day and you want to put in a different meal um, that wasn't even planned for that week. You can definitely do that. I would just try and make sure that you're swapping, keeping breakfast and lunch similar, so those two can be swapped you can have breakfast for lunch or lunch for breakfast. Um, but dinner is a little bit more specific depending on if you're following like the advanced weight loss protocol or the athlete protocol. Um, so just make sure read through the complete intermittent fasting bundle for especially the 21 day intermittent fasting program. So you get an understanding of that, but for breakfast and lunch specifically, they can be swapped or you can put in different lunches or different breakfasts, breakfast, breakfasts. None of that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> is your dog getting along with your baby or is she jealous? Um, she's a little jealous, but she's, she's very sweet and gentle with her. <laughs> okay. I have a sensitive sensitivity to dairy, eggs, and coconut. What can I use in my shakes instead of yogurt and coconut milk? You can use any of the um, unsweetened nut or seed milks that I just mentioned. I think I talked about like five minutes ago or so. Um, and in terms of the protein component, you'll want to make sure since you are sensitive to dairy. First, first question I have is, are you sensitive to dairy in general? Um, or is it lactose specifically? Like, are you lactose intolerant? Because if you're lactose intolerant, then you still could very likely use a whey protein, especially whey isolate protein, which is like what I personally use and what my protein is, that's zero sugar. Um, it's just the high, you know, whey protein is the one of the most studied um, supplements that is out there. It's very high quality in terms of body recomposition. So it's the one that obviously I use for creating my protein because I found it to be the highest quality. Um, but if you are even sensitive, like allergic to the dairy protein specifically, um, then the next best option, since you can't use eggs either, would be a plant-based protein. Although I'm not a big fan of those. I found they have so many issues with, um, they can tend to cause so many gut health issues. I found with a lot of my clients, they tend to cause bloating for a lot of people. It's also just very low quality compared to other proteins like whey protein, um, very low on the dyad score, which is a measurement of protein quality. Um, but that would be your next best op next best option if you can't have dairy at all or eggs um, at all, which egg white protein would be the second best option. Then it's going to be the plant-based option. <laughs> Mary, hi, just bought your protein powder and made waffles and oh my gosh, best, wa best waffle and protein ever. Thank you. Yeah, I have um, a, obviously my zero sugar protein powder that I just mentioned. Uh, you can see it right there, there, right there. <laughs> uh, it makes really great protein waffles. I've been like living off those for my first meal lately. And pro tip, you can make a bunch of protein waffles and then just freeze them. I freeze them with um, like parchment paper in between so they don't stick together, pop them in the toaster. It's amazing. It's like having healthy Eggos. Uh, and I have the recipe for um, the waffle recipe in my blog. If you guys want to check that out again, just type like Autumn Bates protein waffle on um, Google and that recipe should pop right up. I also just recently shared the recipe on YouTube, think like two weeks ago. So you'll also be able to find the recipe there for the protein waffle. Uh, Karen, what can we substitute for artichokes? So artichokes, I think you mentioned specifically in the Mediterranean salad recipe. 
Um, so one of the recipes within the detox program uses artichokes. The, the benefit of artichokes for that recipe is that it's very high in fiber. Artichokes are surprisingly so high in fiber. Um, so what we want to do is swap it out for something that is also very high in fiber. So if you want like a kind of an equivalent, really rich high fiber option, then taking the artichokes out, maybe having raspberries on the salad or having raspberries on the side, that would be a really great easy way to add in additional high quality fiber. Pretty simply, you could use about a cup of it and it would provide roughly seven grams of fiber, which is very rich in fiber. Uh, Diane, in the broccoli salad, uh, broccoli detox salad from seven day detox, can you sub pump, sub out the sunflower seeds and use pumpkin seeds instead? Yes, you definitely can. In fact, pumpkin seeds are really rich in magnesium, um, which is an important electrolyte for, um, muscle recovery and preventing muscle cramps. So also great if you want to swap out pumpkin seeds, totally fine. Okay, guys, so we are in week one of the fall intermittent fasting challenge. We're starting with detox week this week. If you guys want to join in, it is not too late. The link for how to join in, all the details for the challenge is down in the description below. You can also find it on my blog at autumnlnutrition.com um, forward slash blog and autumn, E-L-L-E, nutrition.com. But easiest way to find it is the link down description below. So if you guys want to join in, check that out. We will have a live stream next week as well for week two of the challenge when we're starting off with intermittent fasting and the 21-day intermittent fasting program. So we're going to be going into additional details, tips and strategies that you can help to build upon with the 21-day intermittent fasting program. But otherwise, guys, cheers to Detox Week. Make sure you're having enough water. Um, and I will see you guys 